Thank you, Professor Frame, John Howard, distinguished guests. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all those who will follow me in the program today in thanking Professor Frame for organising this conference. And could I say what a valuable task I think it will perform if it helps to set out the agenda for the historians as they try to see the 1996 Howard government and the years that followed in historical perspective. My remarks this morning are entitled Menzies' Forgotten People and the Howard Battlers and you'll immediately see that that requires me not to focus just on 1996 or the Howard Battlers but to try to see the Howard government in a longer time frame a longer perspective. And the primary point I want to make to you this morning is that there would have been no Howard Battler campaign in 1996 and in the couple of election campaigns that followed if there had not been a Forgotten People campaign. That in fact what happened during the 1940s set many of the patterns in Australian politics and many of the approaches to campaigning and developed significant campaigning instruments that carried on right through to 1996 and beyond. And Menzies' approach to the forgotten people raised issues about what constitutes effective campaigning in Australia, how you go about winning historic elections, and what is the nature of Australia as a society that leads those fighting the campaigns to frame their questions in particular kinds of ways. Perhaps I should say at the start that neither the Forgotten People nor the Howard Battlers were really named in campaign slogans. But they did shape the campaigns, those ideas, those groups in the community, and they shaped policy programs. But nor were they campaigns that were confined to Australia in their fundamental character and their policies and programs were not unique. There was a parallel to the Howard Battlers in the Reagan Democrats and an unmistakable if unintended echo of Menzies in the comment that Donald Trump made on election night that the forgotten men and women of our country, he meant America, will be forgotten no longer. Indeed, the Australian election whose voting map, and we'll hear some about these voting maps later in the day, most re resembles Donald Trump's winning campaign in the United States, where the American Democrats were forced back to the big cities and regional, small town, rural residents went Republican, is most closely matched in Australia I believe by the election map of Malcolm Fraser's campaign in 1975 when the Labor Party lost every seat but one in Queensland, every seat but one in Western Australia and all of Tasmania and the whole country. In Australia, of course, we give our side of politics blue rather than red as they do in the United States, but the whole country went blue except for a few red spots in the cities. And there's a very great significance for this because it tells us that what happens in Australian politics is in many ways related to matters, issues, social structures, political problems that arise throughout Western industrial society. The second introductory point I want to make is that when I refer to the Forgotten People campaigns, I'll be referring not only to Menzies' book which started out as a 
radio talk on the 22nd of May 1942, but to his 1946 and 1949 campaigns, which implemented the ideas and the strategies and used the organisation that he foreshadowed in the original talk and in a book he published the following year in 1943. And when I refer to the Howard Battler campaigns, I'm referring, of course, specifically to 1996, but also having in mind that the Howard Battlers, as we'll hear later in the day, came over and continued to come over to the Howard government in later years, in 2001 and 2004. Now, coming back to focus on Menzies and, and what the forgotten people tells us and why answering the question why the Howard Battler campaign would not have occurred without the forgotten people campaigns, I think probably the starting point is to look at how Menzies defined the forgotten people. Who were they? And he calls them in his original talk the forgotten class. And he writes, let me first define that class by exclusion. I excluded one end of the scale, the rich and powerful, which will surprise many people, those who control great funds and enterprises and are, as a rule, able to protect themselves. Though it must be said that in a political sense, they have, as a rule, shown neither comprehension nor competence, which tells you something about Bob's attitude to some of the wealthy in the society, and it carried on through his Liberal Party. But I exclude them because, in most material differences, the rich can look after themselves. And then he said, I excluded the other end of the scale, the mass of unskilled people, almost invariably well organised and with their wages and conditions protected by popular law. What I am excluding them from, he went on to say, is the definition of the middle class. We can't exclude them from the problem of social progress, for one of the prime objects of modern social and political policy is to give them a proper measure of security and provide the conditions which will enable them to acquire skill, knowledge and individuality. These exclusions being made, he said, I include the intervening range, the kind of people I myself represent in Parliament, salary earners, shopkeepers, skilled artisans, professional men and women, farmers and so on. These are, in the political and economic sense, the middle class. They are, for the most part, unorganised and unselfconscious. They are envied by those whose social benefits are largely obtained by taxing them, they are not rich enough to have individual power. They are taken for granted by each political party in turn. They are not sufficiently lacking in individualism to be organised for what in these days we will call pressure politics, and yet, as I have said, they are the backbone of the nation. Now, that was a crucial statement in defining how Menzies was to see the party that he set up two years later in 1944, the Liberal Party of Australia. It was not a party for big business, it was not a party for the rich, and it was not going to be a party that fought hand to fist for the highly organised, trade unionised, unskilled and semi-skilled working class vote. It was to aim at the great middle, and Menzies' view was that this class was being crushed between the top and the bottom. The interests of both the top and the bottom are well and loudly heard by politics, and the people in the middle were overlooked. Now, Menzies saw that the ideas which the Labor Party then in power was putting forward would not deliver to the middle class or indeed, he believed, to the workers, those organised in the trade unions, the standard of living, the opportunities that they sought, that there was a misguided set of political ideas dominating the political spectrum. There were lots of things he didn't like about Australia at the time as it had developed out of the Depression. One was he saw it as a deeply divided society and sectarianism was rife after Billy Hughes' campaigns of the First World War. 
But the thing he liked least about that society was the deliberate promotion of the idea of a class war. But somehow or other there was some inherent conflict of interest between those who were employees and those who were employers. And if I can use a phrase that he didn't use, but I think is very applicable and applies today, he saw that the country was in the grip of a terrible political correctness. The belief that capitalism was failing, that there was a group of people who knew better than everybody else, the small group of what he would call the intellectual class or the pseudo-intellectuals, the pseudo-intelligentsia, that had developed this idea that you could have a government-run society, you could put the market on the back seat, you could administer the economy, and you could create the better world. But it meant, Menzies saw, depriving people of the opportunities and the empowerment that knowledge gave them through education to set out and seize their own goals and missions in life. So it was, in a way, the first great campaign in Australia against political correctness. And to challenge that political correctness, Menzies outlined in the book that he published in 1943, The Forgotten People, what he called his whole summarised political philosophy, which was that the strength of the Australian economy its prosperity, its economic growth, its development depended on unleashing the entrepreneurial and creative energies of the Australian people and educating them in the skills and knowledge they needed to take advantage of those opportunities. You would never get economic prosperity or economic growth by just focusing on government public works and having government try to plan the economy. He liked, admired, of course, as everybody did the Snowy Mountain Scheme, but that wasn't the way to economic prosperity for Australia. It was just basic infrastructure, basic prosperity dependence. So that gave the long-term Liberal Party and ultimately the Australian people an understanding that economic, good economic management and economic opportunity was crucial. His approach to putting the class war in the waste paper basket of history was intended to convey the message to the Australian people that everyone should have opportunity. It was individuals who mattered. There was a classlessness in Menzies' attitudes which he derived from the great liberal tradition in Australia, which had always hated class politics. And of course, they were ideas which came through very strongly in the Forgotten People campaigns. The party that he set up was a party designed for the individual, with individual membership. It was a party designed to bring women into politics. And the great education policies he put in place were, as he said, in 1942, for every, to provide opportunity to all boys and girls, for every hundred boys and girls now in our education system, he said, in 1942, there must be a thousand. We have to get used to women in tertiary education. So Menzies transformed first the ideas, then the policy framework of Australian politics. And by we, the time we get to 1996, we have a radical transformation in the character of Australian society as a result of that strategy. And the Howard Battler campaign is particularly interesting, I think, in this, because John Howard was able, in this society, to reach down and extend the base of the Liberal Party into the traditional base of the Labor Party, because that base had adopted these Menzies-type values of aspiration, of opportunity, 
They were more educated. They knew more. And they could see that the Labor Party then, as in the 1940s, was a party that in many ways was out of touch with that base. And that's the last point I, I want to make. Underlying this whole political trend, there was a change in Australia's social structure. And paradoxically, it had come about because of Menzies' emphasis on education. Menzies believed in education because he believed it was the foundation of reasoned, rational policy. And an educated democracy would be much less prejudiced, much more in less interested in identity politics, more interested in policies that worked. And broadly speaking, we could say that he was right. But of course, in Menzies' day, the class war was not the result of the working class. The class war was an idea which had come from intellectuals. It was the influence on the Labor Party of the left-wing intellectual, the so-called progressive, which had created that class war. And Menzies was very explicit about that in The Forgotten People. The result of Menzies' education policies, which inflated and vastly expanded the proportion of those in Australia who had finished secondary school and finished university, was to enlarge that intellectual class. And many of them went on the radical side. They did so perhaps first in environmentalism, and John Howard fought deep green environmentalism in the 1996 campaign as a result of that class. There was an elitism in that class that, while it didn't have the old left views of the 1940s, had developed a new approach to society where the political agenda was focused not on economics but on social transformation. And the wider that class became, of course, the more it occupied the centres of power, the big corporations, the state. It had occupied the church, some of the church uh, hierarchy in the 1940s. Uh, it began to occupy the leadership groups, even in the trade unions. And by 1996, it was already on the way to becoming to, what it is sometimes referred to as today the ruling class. But of course, there were many others in that educated class who believed with Menzies that what was important was individual empowerment. That it was the individual that mattered, it was the individual rights that mattered. And the aim of the party was to reassure people that they were not forgotten. And the Howard Battlers had that sense, and we'll hear much more about this today, I think, from Andrew Robb and, 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 and others, who looked at the research in that 1996 campaign, that that sense of being overlooked, of being forgotten, of wanting to be included, of still having an economic aspiration and wanting economic opportunity was the key thing, and not the agendas of the tertiary educated professional group who, the radicals amongst them, who in Abraham Maslow's term, if I can use uh, what I think has been a remarkably successful academic exercise, they had become interested in self-actualisation. They'd become interested in moral and humanitarian issues. And not to say the issues, important issues, but forced into the agenda as the main issues, they meant that the economic aspirations which were still fundamental to the forgotten people and to the Howard Battlers had been overlooked. So my final comment before just opening this for questions is um, uh, that the case can be made against the most intense political correctness. It is possible to win those debates as Menzies did in The Forgotten People and as John Howard did in 1996.
will now circulate microphones. Could you please wait until the microphone comes to you for the purposes of asking a question, and could you begin with your name for the purpose of the recording? It would help us to know who you are. And we always like short questions here at UNSW Canberra. The first question. Let me ask, because no one can stop me, what's the discordant notes, though, between the Forgotten and the Battlers? They're not the same people. And in terms of the messaging, how did you notice, perhaps, being aware of Menzies' approach to the approach that either the coalition took or ought to have taken between, say, 1942 and the differences then in 1996? You're quite right. Uh, they're not the same people, but they do overlap. Uh, Menzies included the skilled artisan in the forgotten people, and that's the skilled tradesman. And the skilled tradesman is kind of the small business uh, that was suffering in 1996 as a result of the, the recession they had to have uh, and high interest rates that were having a devastating effect on small business. Um, and, and I think the, the reneging on the LAW tax law was also a part of that sort of economic concern. Uh, but at the same time, there was a feeling in the Menzies battlers that uh, the government had become elitist, that it, it, was, it was not concerned with their issues, it was concerned with other issues. It wasn't just that the Prime Minister collected French clocks and flew over Australia. It, it, it was that the, uh, the government um, uh, was concerned and, and listening to those whose environmental solutions were actually anti-job and going to destroy jobs. Uh, so the appeals, and, and John Howard, I think, successfully in 1996, within that group, you know, with, under the, with the campaign directed by Andrew Robb, reached down into the unskilled. And trade unionism had weakened. As a result of the economic prosperity, that group had become more footloose. And politically, they were available for recruitment in a way that hadn't been so before, and so for the first time in 1996, the Liberal Party managed to win a majority of the, or the, the, the plurality of the blue collar vote. Um, and, and of course, the campaign was narrower in that sense. Uh, Menzies was fighting, I think, a tighter political correctness, and he, he went right from the start. He laid out an entire philosophy, and, and uh, he, he, from that, developed his policy program. I think in 1996, much of that was taken for granted. It was understood that the Liberals were there to help those who had still had economic aspirations, as well as dealing with the social issues, but in a non-authoritarian way. Thank you. Questions, please. Thank you very much for your address. Desmond Wood, Seapower Centre. In 1945, the immediate ex-service vote in the UK voted Churchill out and Clement Attlee in, in pursuit of uh, social welfare. Um, how did Menzies handle the ex-service vote and how did he make sure that it remained on his side and didn't become radicalised towards uh, Labour Party objectives? Well, the political context of the two countries was, of course, different because in England there had been a national government with the Conservatives at the head. In Australia there hadn't been. There'd been a Labor government. And um, uh, it was a Labor government that was encouraged uh, to continue by its left wing uh, the thought of the post-war economy, the wartime regulation into the future. Uh, so Menzies had a different ta political task. The Liberal Party included uh, in its founding unity conference the Services and Citizens Party. Uh, he very much had his eye on the returned servicemen's vote. And of course, soldier settlement was one of the major elements of his campaigns in the later 1940s. Thank you. Any questions? Susan Ryrie, Invisible Person. Um, I understand you're an academic. Do you feel that now um, tertiary qualified people skew towards the left? 
And Mr. Last Sentence. Do you feel now that tertiary qualified people skew towards the left? Um, I think I think it's probably right, um, but it, it's it's not tertiary educated people as a whole. It tends to be in certain faculties. Um, the, uh, the the social theory which is around at the moment encourages that in much the same way that the social theory that was around in the 1940s encourages that. Uh, but the careers like engineering, medicine, uh, law has moved a bit in that direction. Uh, there's been a change in legal theory. Uh, the universities have um, a level of independence which allows that to happen, but it is not true, never, nevertheless, that the, you know, if you looked at the educational level of voters, that voters uh, from with tertiary education all go to Labor. That's not the case. In fact, they used to all go, mostly go Liberal, except for the small left-wing group. Today it is more evenly divided, and partly for that reason. Uh, but partly I think the reason is more of an intellectual reason. It's a, it's a focus on social issues. It's not a focus on how you run an economy to produce growth and opportunity. And uh, that's a still concern to many of those with tertiary education, but on the whole, those at, with tertiary education who are economically satisfied, let's say, who have a level of affluence which allows them to look elsewhere, do look elsewhere, and unless one has some background in political philosophy and understands the issues of uh, the, the clumsiness of state power and uh, the limitations on the knowledge the state has and the fact that individuals in society are really the sources of initiative and energy, as Menzies said, uh, then it is easy to drift towards what one might think of as left-wing solutions. Final question from Dr Nelson. Thank you, David. Uh, Brendan yes, Nelson. The, the other dimension of uh, Menzies' forgotten people was uh, their children and families, and he regarded their children as being, they're seeing in them the greatest contribution that they would make to the country. To what extent, uh, coming into the 1996 election campaign, did families and focus on families frame the Howard Battlers? Mm. Well, that's quite right. Um, the family was critical, and that was part of Menzies' statement that really values are important here. Uh, the values of the forgotten people uh, were values of family and hence patriotism. Uh, they were values that kept the torch of learning alight, was the phrase that he used. Uh, and in 1996, it's very interesting that the, the, the campaign focused quite a bit on training that was real, an educational opportunity, and so a lot about apprenticeships. Uh, and giving people training that wasn't just to go through the motion so the government could be seen to be doing something, but opening that door of opportunity again uh, that um, Labor didn't seem serious about, but that because of its orientation to a sort of much wider group of people, to the whole society and to individuals and families, the Liberals uh, did put forward in their program. There will, of course, be opportunity for you to speak to all of the presenters during the breaks if there are questions that you have that you perhaps didn't want to ask in open session. There will be a chance to do that at morning tea, lunchtime and an afternoon tea. Would you please join with me, though, in thanking Dr. Thank you very much.